So, Excellency, Honorable Guest Speaker around the globe, ladies and gentlemen. Next, I would like to invite our next guest speaker, Dr. Kelly Kings, Ms. Emika Toshposta, Ms. Esther Cho Yahu, the professor, the also the associate professor and undergraduate students, University of Fuku School of Global Community Study, Fuku, Japan. Our guest speaker will be presenting on Swiss learning experience as mentoring being in the university in the university and in the community. Our guest speaker will have 30 minutes for the presentation, including question and answer. So our guest speaker, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly King, and I'm coming to you from uh, Fukui in Japan. Um, it's, we're starting a little early, right? <laughs> we're starting a little bit early on my clock, right? Yes, is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. yes that's correct. And nice okay, to see so, you again. Thank you. And nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, before I begin, um, I first of all would like to say um, thank you very much uh, to Dr. Chan Roth, uh, Sun Samara, um, all of the great people at New Generation Pedagogical Research Center, um, Horman for all of your work on this, um, and um, congratulations for creating such a great conference and an opportunity for us. But I still hope next year uh, to see you all. <laughs> <laughs> to see you all um, in Cambodia. <laughs> okay, so um, can you hear me? Is there, can everybody hear me? Yes, of course, we can hear you well. Thank you. Okay, okay, great. Um, so my part of this today is to basically uh, give you the background uh, information about a course that I'm teaching. And um, and then I'm going to turn it over to two of my students, uh, Emika Tsubota and um, Ethel Jinyahu, uh, who have been working in service learning. And the question is really, um, is this mentoring or not? And we've been thinking about this. And um, I first started thinking about this um, probably in the summer when my students were giving presentations and they were talking about what they had done in their service learning experience. And I thought, this is mentoring. They're actually mentoring. Um, it's beyond just helping students um, in the, you know, in their school, in their, in their learning, but um, they were doing other things as well. So um, I will give them time to talk about their experiences and I hope that you enjoy that. Um, now I know that, um, contexts are very different. So in Cambodia um, and at the New Generation Pedagogical Research Center, um, you are all training to become mentors to teachers, right? So a lot of the people that you're working with are, um, you know, they're already working in the school system. Um, what we're doing in this class is, uh, in a sense, um, training, if you will, students to be you know stu our university students to support elementary school students, uh, junior high school students, high school students, and act as sort of mentors for them. Um, so whether or not we're doing a good job, uh, we maybe we'll find out today from the students. Um, so do you have my uh, PowerPoint? Yes, I truly have. Thank you. So give me a moment. I share the screen. For sure, you. sure. Thank you. So give me a minute, thank you. No problem. We finding a slide presentation. This way, the moment. Sorry. It's okay.
We're sharing now. Thank you. It's Thank you. Bit of processing. It's okay. We have to do this twice. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, thank you. It's um, right now. So, um, when I'm finished with the slide, I'll just say next slide. Okay. Is that all right? Thank you. Yes. And then right. my thank students you. will do the same thing. Okay. All right. So, uh, the title of our um, presentation is Service Learning Experiences Mentoring Being in the University and in the Community. And um, once again, uh, Kelly King, myself, uh, Ethel, Jun Yao Hu, and Emika Tsubota, uh, who are two students, uh, third year students in the School of Global and Community Studies here at the University of Fukui. Uh, next slide. Okay, so again, um, just again, my part of the presentation is to provide a big picture, the context, right? Um, the background, and then I'm going to hand it over to them, and they're going to talk about their work uh, in service learning. Okay, does that sound all right? And um, I won't be following the slides too closely, but they're there for you so that you can hopefully follow uh, my train of thought. Okay, so um, let's look at the next slide, slide three. So, um, Setting is important, context is important. So uh, we're here in Japan. Um, and um, as you can see, um, I'm a long-term resident of Japan. Um, I'm American, but I've lived here for 30 plus years. I've worked at the universities, or different universities for about 20 plus years in Japan. Um, and so most of my uh, personal, ex my, most of my um, work experience, professional experience has been in Japan. But my education has been mostly in the US. So that does bear a lot of, on you know, how I look at um, courses, how I think about courses, and so forth. Um, also, the fact that um, when I did my master's degree, um, as well as my, my PhD, but my master's degree, um, I focused on um, bilingualism, uh, you know, learning English as second language, and um, all of these kinds of things. And so I bring that with me to uh, the University of Fukui, to the School of um, Global Community Studies. And, you know, my present, uh, my, my dissertation for my PhD was also about um, children of immigrants in Japanese schools. So this is a topic that um, I care a lot about personally. Um, and all of my courses that I teach in this program, um, whether it be the academic reading, uh, introduction to tutoring, social justice issues in education, intercultural communication, and this PBL, it's a project-based learning course, um, all sort of connect to this in some way or another. Okay, and please, uh, the next slide. Okay, so the context. Um, globalization and recent immigration in Japan. Um, so many people uh, see um, Japan as very homogeneous and um, you know that is the way that is presented most of the time. Um, but a lot of changes are happening. And since the 1990s, um, lots of uh, immigration, uh, particularly with certain groups of people, uh, Nikkei are Brazilian and Peruvians of um, Japanese descent, and they were brought in in the 1990s to help work with, you know, so-called unskilled labor. Um, and at the time, um, maybe the original people who thought about doing this didn't really think about it so deeply. But you know, these people came with their families, uh, stepchildren, uh, and their children who spoke Portuguese and Spanish. Um, and so at this time, from you know, now it's you know almost you know, it's been a, been a while. We have a lot, number of non-Japanese speakers in Japanese mainstream schools. Um, and then more recently, uh, 2018, 2019, um, there have been changes that have allowed different people to come in um, and work in Japan from a variety of places. And again, these sort of imported workers and this growing diversity um, is something that is happening, even in places like Fukui, which is a smaller, um, city, right? So, um, the, you know, the workforce is becoming more diverse and the ch number of children in the schools is, um, you know, the, the number of 
non-Japanese speakers in the Japanese schools is becoming larger. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so just for an example, uh, 25, there's a 25% increase in immigrant children attending Japanese schools between 20, um, 2008, 2018. Um, these are some of the top 10 nationalities of immigrant children. And again, I'm focusing on children here, um, Chinese, Brazilian, Korean, Filipino, Vietnamese, Peruvian, Nepalese, American, Indian, Indonesian. Okay, now something that's not included here uh, are a number of children who do speak or who are bilingual um, or who speak um, a language other than Japanese as a mother tongue, but they have a Japanese nationality. Um, they're not included in these numbers. So there are a lot more um, children, I think, in the schools than is actually on these charts. Um, and a very important point here is that um, although Japanese schools provide education for children of immigrants, um, they, it's, it's not compulsory education. So children do not need to attend, um, they, they don't have to attend schools. And so um, in a sense, this means that this is kind of a favor to the children rather than an obligation. Um, and so this does impact um, what you know, education is available for children who enter the school without being able to speak uh, the language that is used in the schools. Now, uh, I think this is a situation that happens for a lot of people, um, a lot of children in the, around the world, right? It's not an unusual situation that children are entering schools um, with, you know, the home language that's being used is not the language that's used in the schools. So just imagine how difficult that is at the very beginning. So these are some of the things that, um, you know, kind of um, affect um, all of the children were, you know, in the schools, but also um, these are some of the things that I want the students um, in these project-based learning classes in um, the School of Global and Community Studies to understand. Okay, could you go into the next slide, please? Okay, um, so this is just a little bit of, from um, our school, the School of Global and Community Studies. And um, one, thing. Um, so you see here um, some of the ideas, what, you know, these are some of the issues that are happening in the regional, in a regional place like Fukui, a smaller place like Fukui. Um, and so they're kind of talking about responses to globalization. And this is our program, right? And if you notice, um, it might be a little bit difficult to see here, but these are um, issues attached here, right? And globalization and the development of a multi-ethnic society is considered a kind of issue, right? Whereas I, I wanna think of it more as um, something very positive. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, that, you know, society is becoming more multi-ethnic, right? You know, diversity is not a bad word. It's not the enemy. But um, so within uh, the GCS program, um, this is one of the reasons for me wanting to change my project-based learning program uh, into a service learning program. Okay, and so could you change to the next slide, please? Okay, and so um, yesterday my colleague Christopher Hennessy was talking a little bit about his project-based learning class, and um, I realized as he was talking that my course is a little bit different. Um, so. I focus on service learning um, because service learning has an explicit focus on supporting learning to, you know, learning from and together with the community. And the community that I really want to focus on uh, is the community, um, the growing community of um, non-Japanese people, immigrant people living in this area and um, connecting, integrating immigrants into um, the, you know, the Fukui society. Okay, this is a major point of this. And so um, with through service learning, uh, the students have a chance to go into the schools um, and connect with um, teachers who are working with immigrant children uh, and connect directly with the Im immigrant children um, and support them in different ways. Okay, um, could you go to the next slide? Okay, um, this is just a little bit, this is taken from my syllabus this semester. Um, it has changed a little bit. It started as a research course to find out what the issues were, what the um, 
maybe what was needed as support in um, Fukui for foreign nationals. Um, but um, again, the course content is the global within the local. Um, the students are, are taking part in a service learning project that is organized and supported by two um, faculty who are outside of my own faculty. Both of them are Japanese language professors. Okay, um, but ultimately our goal is to create a community of individuals who work together and support integration of foreign residents in Fukui. And so um, the students engage directly in support of Japanese as second language learners in one of three community partner institutions, reflect upon these experiences and report and consider how to improve our service learning. Okay, next. Okay, uh, just some of the texts that we use. Um, one of the very important points, and it's been brought up in a number of other presentations that I've listened to, is self-reflection. Um, you know, self-reflection journals, um, writing while they are um, talking to, um, you know, their, who, when they're supporting the students that they're working with. Um, lots and lots of self-reflection. We get together back in class. Uh, we talk about um, their experiences. We, they share their experiences together, um, ask questions, think about how they can do it better. They have um, meetings with the community members, the teachers that they're working with outside of our class. And um, we also read more, right? Uh, so we start with what we know already, but we read more. We learn more about um, these issues throughout Japan. Okay, and the next slide. Okay, and so we have, you know, our uh, expected outcomes for the students are to use self-reflective writing um, to develop more understanding of the school cultures, but as well as also the macro issues involved. Um, and some of these things they can learn by doing the work, but some of these things they have to learn through reading as well. So um, it's not one or the other, it's really both in this course. Um, but um, through their experiences, um, they learn a lot more about the processes of second language learning and bilingualism. Um, and we want to continue doing the service learning project. So it's very important for the students who are taking the course now to talk to their kohai, their younger students, um, and also help them learn about this as well. But um, I've talked too long for now, and I would really like to turn this over to um, Ethel and Emika. So you can turn off my slides and um, please bring up their slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nata, for your great presentation. Great to see you. Hope you remember me. I remember you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Okay. Emika, Ethel, are you okay? Yes. Good to see you. Good morning. Good afternoon, actually. <laughs> Can we begin? Okay. So, hello. My name is Emika, and I am currently a third year student at Fuku University. When I was in elementary school, I lived in Malaysia for five years and came back to Japan. At high school, I spent 10 months living in New Zealand to study abroad. So I have spent some years using English in my life. My name is Hu Jun Yao. You can call me Ethel. I'm a third year student of Global and Community Studies at the University of Kui. I come from Shanghai, China. I'm focusing on the study on foreign student education in Japan and tend to enter in our graduate program after my graduation. So, are we mentors supporting immigrant children in local schools? Um, next slide, please. So, today we will talk about introduction of our service learning site and then language problems and then problems happening outside of school and our support of two immigrant children's students. So we have taken part in a service learning project which is connected with the Japanese junior high school in Fukui Prefecture. 
What we do is language support, and both of us have experience of living out of Japan, which lead us to have a similar feelings with foreign students in Japan. What's more, as we all know, there's growing number of foreign people coming to Japan, to Fukui. With the globalization facts inside us, we start to choose the service learning that focuses on foreign students. Next slide, please. So our service learning site was held at the local junior high school, which is located in the middle of Fukui city. In the first semester, we supported a Chinese student and this semester, which started from October, Ethel is supporting the same student as before, and I started to support a Philippine student. Mainly Japanese and Chinese support is needed for the Chinese student, and for the Philippine student, English support is needed. In this school, there are three foreign students, and two of them need language support. The school system in Japan has obligated the English classes from elementary school last year, and usually four hours a week, although they are all held in Japanese. So this is one of the problems that foreign students could not understand because English classes are held in Japanese language. Another problem is that there are no specific supporting classes for the foreign students. Our goal here is to to develop the language skills and to gain confidence, which they don't have at the moment. Next slide, please. So first I will talk about the Chinese student. There were several issues she had with Japanese, English, and even Chinese. For Japanese, she had problems with reading kanji and hiragana correctly in Japanese. Although she is from China, kanji may be familiar to her, but the way it is pronounced are different. Another thing is that she is having difficulties distinguishing the pronunciation of ha, which can be pronounced as wa or ha. For example, there is a sen sentence like watashi wa daigakusei desu, which means I am a university student. And in this case, it's pronounced as wa. But another word like hana, which means flower in Japanese, are pronounced as ha. And this is quite confusing. Next slide, please. For English, this, is, this language is her third language. So she is finding it more difficult than Japanese. For example, there was a sentence like karera wa umi ni itta, which means they went to the sea. And she tries to write he went to the sea rather than they went to the sea. In this sentence, she has to figure out who the subject is. In this case, Japanese has many words to describe subjects, like watashi, boku, ore, which means I, and kare, karera, and so on. So she gets mixed up with these problems. After she understands it, she then tries to translate it into Chinese to make it easier. Also, she has to translate the English word to Japanese, then to Chinese, which is a lot of work. Next, it is about a Philippine student. Next slide, please. In her case, her mother language is Tagalog, but she only speaks when she gets back to Philippines. So with her family right now, she uses English as a communication tool. Her speaking and listening skills have no problem, but her writing skill does. So for Japanese, in her case, Japanese is her third language. She has been in Japan for about four years and she is in the first grade of junior high school. However, she's doing the second grade of kanji in elementary school, which is a huge problem. Normally, it is necessary to know all the kanji learned in elementary school. Otherwise, students will not be able to read the textbook used in junior high. Moreover, Japanese students will learn kanji as an obligation until junior high school. So at the same time, every other student is uh, studying um, junior high school level, but she is still in the elementary level, which is a serious problem. For English, 
The problem is that she could not write a paragraph since she only could write short sentences. This is because she lacks confidence in spelling and doesn't try to write a long word, meaning the sentence she writes is all in simple English and doesn't try to write a new word, which she learned. Although she could speak fluent English and use difficult words, she can't write it down. According to her homeroom teacher, she even gives up reading long paragraphs and to think as well. Next slide, please. So next is about importance of mother tongue. Currently, both students that we are supporting need to develop their mother tongue as well. In this case, Chinese students' mother tongue is Chinese and the Philippine students' mother tongue is English. In order to learn another language, the mother tongue needs to be strong. When there is a word like fundamental, for example, and if they are given the word in their mother tongue, but when they do not understand, what will happen? They will not be able to understand it in English, I mean, in Japanese. In order to solve this problem, a mother tongue supporting class is needed, as well as Japanese language support, like the project we are doing at our class. The reality is that teachers at junior high school are really busy, and also there are no teachers who are in charge of the foreign students. So we think it is better to solve the problem by continuing this program and to help those students who are having difficulties with their language. Next slide, please. After talking about problems that happen in the school, there are some other problems that happen outside school. In our service learning, two foreign students didn't come to Japan as they are wanted. Instead, they have to adapt changes to their lives which are caused by their parents. Especially for junior high school students, they are in the bloom of yours, so their emotions need others to give them a lot of attention. When we have a look at foreign students' daily life, school, Japanese society, and family are full of their life. Next slide, please. Let's start with Japanese society. Since our service learning is in Fukui, Japan, we search for information about foreign students on Fukui's government website. There is some information which aims to help foreign students with their Japanese from the support of the government, some of these are free. Even if these classes aren't free, they are much cheaper than classes in Japanese schools. Thanks to this support for foreign students, some students can take these advantages and improve their Japanese a lot. However, in my case, the parents are worried about the student's safety when she goes to these classes by herself. Also, according to different backgrounds of foreign student family, not every student can join these classes. Next slide, please. On the other hand, family means a lot to foreign students. Although foreign parents have to spend more time on working than Japanese parents, parents do want to have more time to keep their children accompanied. However, because of coronavirus, parents get less income than before. It is obviously that parents need to pay more attention to their family finances. Their temper may not be so good when they face their children. They bring some pressures from their work to their family sometimes, which makes the distance between children and the, themselves. What's more, not all foreign parents have enough knowledge to teach, educate their children. The reason why they have to come to Japan to make a living maybe is that they cannot earn so much money in their hometown. They feel helpless about their children's education, but still hope their children could be better than themselves. Next slide, please. So, from supporting a student from the Philippines, I started supporting this student from October and it has been about six sessions until now. Her weakness is in English writing skills, as I said before, so mainly I focus on the grammar. Mostly I support using the textbook from the school and to focus on the grammar written in each page. As I supported her for 
several times, I re realized that her grammar is good enough. But when I ask her to write an example sentence, she only uses simple words. And if there was a word she does not know how to spell, she stops and asks for help. It is not good to give an answer at first. So confidencing her and making her think that mistake is not a bad thing is the most important thing I have in my mind. I was start, starting to think that her main cause for her language ability is not just confidence, but also the fact that she understands the class held at school or not. In this support, I support her in English and she tends to understand what she's learning. So when I was supporting pronoun, which is daimeshi in Japanese, she could not read the kanji, nor read the sentence written in Japanese in the textbook. The reason why her writing skill is so weak is that she could not understand the class at school, so she couldn't motivate herself in studying and to try to write. In the future, I hope she could gain confidence in her writing and to motivate herself up by this support. Next slide, please. From my experience of supporting that Chinese student, I found the biggest problem is that she didn't have a good learning habit. As we mentioned before, these foreign children's parents are too busy to take care of their children's education. As a child, it's impossible for her to know how to learn independently. When she come back to come back from school, there is no one at home. So she watches TV, do everything she wants except learning. She didn't have the image of learning. Also, she cannot understand why it is important to do homework after school. When she was a primary school student, the knowledge isn't too difficult, so she could review them before the test. However, junior high school students have no way to remember everything just before the examination. This is the weak point we have to overcome. Since the Chinese students have a bicultural background, while she lives in Japan, which means she has less chance to get access to Chinese culture. In my opinion, it's important to enhance her Chinese culture. What's more, she used her for mother, language, mother tongue to import what she learned from the outside. For most of Japanese culture, she, can, she cannot understand the since she is in junior high school, something culturally outside the school is also important. From my point of view, supporting a foreign student in Japan cannot be one-sided work. School, family, and Japanese society should cooperate to provide a good education for these good students. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you so much, Emika and Ethel. Um, so um, I think there's a little bit of time, but I have a question for you. <laughs> so my question is, uh, do you think that what you are doing is mentoring? And if so, why? What, you know, can you explain a little bit? So this is the question, is what we're doing mentoring or not? What do you think? Um, I think I am a little bit of a mentor since it's not just I'm teaching grammar to the student. It's also about um, making her confident in her writing skills and also motivating her up in her studying as well. So in this, in this situation, I think this is a mentor. How about also, you, Ethel? Also for me, like, I don't know the word about mentoring before I do service learning. So during my service learning, I still not only connected the teacher of the school, also connect about her mother or family. So I didn't realize that oh, it is a kind of mentoring, but what we did is really mentoring. And it is not only to help her about what her, her learned in the school, but also what she faced with outside school. Yeah, thank you. And um, I know how much time you've actually spent. Um, you've done more than um, you know once per week. Uh, you know, in case of in the case of um, 
the school that you're working with. Originally, you were supposed to just go once a week, and then you've been going more often than that. Yeah. Um, so my other question to you is, um, do you think that, um, I mean, what do you think that we can do at the university level to help you, to help you create um, a good working relationship with your community partners, the schools, um, and to, or to help you um, with your actual um, community service, your service learning practice? What, could, what else could we be doing from this end? Can you think of anything? Like in my case, I'm also a foreign student in Japan, which means my Japanese is not so good. While I'm doing service learning, I can teach her some simple Japanese, but maybe not so correct. So from my side, I want uh, like a Japan, a good Japanese student to help me about her about her second language in Japan. Yeah, thank you. Emika, do you have anything to add to that? Um, not from my, my case, but I'm, I'm thinking that if we continue this project, the student we, who we are supporting can develop their language skill as well. So I think we should continue this project. Um, yeah, for the future. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think that is the end of our presentation. I think we just have a few minutes left. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, um, we also have, yes, uh, some question waiting for you to answer in the chat box. Thank you very much for your great sharing and interesting topics. So um, allow me to read a question for you. Um, the first question is from uh, Mr. Sosofong. Is Modi. So uh, the question is, what is the role of mentor at the university? What are the challenges sometimes faced with mentoring relationship? That's the first question. Okay. Um, okay, I, I'll try to answer this. Um, so we don't have a definition for mentor here. I mean, this is something that um, we've begun, it, it, it sort of happened as a byproduct of the service learning um, project, I think. Um, at the university, we do have a tutoring program um, and actually both Amika and Ethel are tutors in the program, not surprising. So uh, they, we have different kinds of relationships here. Um, but with, um, for my role, I don't know if I'm a mentor or not. Um, I, I, this is something I'm still thinking about um, in the course itself um, as well. But I think there are a lot of challenges um, because I, I think one of the big issues for this project is we're trying to create a, a network um, where the network doesn't actually exist yet. Um, and there are a lot of different people doing really good work in Fukui. Um, a lot of Japanese language teachers, there's a Japanese language school. Um, there are a lot of people doing good work, but it's all sort of separate. And we're, we're trying to, through this program, um, connect the university more to the community and um, to give students a chance to meet people in the community and kind of understand the issues that way. And um, I would also think that some of the, the mentors to our students, our university students are the community partners. Um, there are teachers that are working in the schools there um, who give our students advice. Um, and we, you know, we really didn't talk about that aspect of it. I, in the future, I would love to bring the teachers as well so that we could really have a, um, a different conversation. Um, in the summer, we did have uh, the teachers from these uh, a junior high school and elementary uh, high school and um, a language school come together with our students and give them feedback, which was very important. But I think there's all kinds of challenges. Um, you know, it could be due to um, age difference, you know, uh, understanding, but you, you know, whenever you mentor someone, 
um, you have to start where the person is, right? You always have to start where the person is. And so I think um, because we all come from somewhat different contexts, it takes some time. And then there's trust issues. Um, I know that some of the other students um, in the class had talked about that it took them a while to gain the trust of the students they were mentoring, um, the students they were working with in the service learning projects in the elementary school or the high school. And so I think, you know, it takes time uh, to build these relationships. It doesn't happen that quickly. So I, sorry, I think I answered in a different way, but do you have anything to add, Emika or Ethel? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your great answer. Thank you. Actually, um, we have some other question, but because of time constraint, I would um, pick up only one more question for you. Um, so another question from Masayo uh, Kanno. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, have you two student, two student presenters found any mentor mentee relationship with the students you supported in, in the uh, Swiss learning course? So that's the question. So, so once again, um, have you, um, two student presenter, found any mentor-mentee relationship with the students you supported in the Swiss learning course? You get a question right now. Yeah, I think yes. you talked about it a little bit, but you could repeat what you what you mentioned. Actually, at some point, you have mentioned a little bit more areas, so. Um, you, you can actually mention a little bit more with some example. Like in my case, the Chinese student, it's hard to find someone to talk, uh, talk with her in Chinese, which means like in her daily life, except her parents, he, she only used Japanese. So like for me, she find like it's someone she can talk more friendly because Chinese is her first language. She can talk with me about what she's thinking because for in Japanese, she cannot express herself so well. And from what she talked with me, I feel like we are not connected, only limited in school. We're also talking about her life, her ambition for the future. So at this point, I feel like, oh, we are not just like a to tour or to team, just like in the school case, but we also like mentor and mentoring after, uh, in, how to say, after school. Yeah. Mm, for me, it's similar to Ethel, but my student also can't really speak in Japanese. So she can express herself in English and she really feels confident when she's being supported through this project and um, so her homeroom teacher told me that after our session she got more talkative and her personality got more like more positive than before so I was really happy to hear that and I thought that this is not just about teaching but also being like a sister since we're the near age and to change her personality and motivation as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So um, do you have any words at the end, Dr. Kelly? Um, I just wanna say thank you so much for allowing us this time uh, to present. Um, I wanna say thank you to Emika and Ethel. <laughs> and um, I really hope that in 2022 that I can come back to see you all at uh, New Generation Pedagogical Research Center and then bring some students as well. But you thank welcome. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Hope to see you very soon. So thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Kelly, Amika, and Asha for the great answer. And thank you for joining us today. So hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you.